Good morning, everybody. Uh, greetings from the Christian Ministry Alliance in Quebec. Uh, I bring greetings on behalf of Dr. Kenzo as well. Uh, we love this church. And did you guys know that you have a pastoral staff that, I mean, we consider to be rock stars. They are amazing. And so it, what a pleasure for me to come and, uh, and fill in for Pastor Joseph. I hope he's having a chance to rest or... I heard maybe he was going to come in today. I, I hope he stayed home. But anyway, it's all good. And I, oh man, I feel for Sam. Um, as a as a worship leader, I have this reoccurring dream that somehow you know I I'm supposed to lead worship and I just can't. There's just something that keeps getting in the way. So I'm wondering if traffic and marathons would be Joseph's uh, you know reoccurring dream. But anyways, or Sam, yeah. So um, but as George shared the worship this morning was fantastic because it was it enabled us to really fix our eyes on the Lord, right? And so um, why don't we pray and uh, and then we'll we'll talk about what God put in my heart for you this morning. So Father, we want to thank you for this this opportunity to spend time with you. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you for your presence with us. And so now we ask uh, we just open our hearts to you. We open our minds. We say, Lord, come and speak to us. Yeah, and actually, Lord, I speak, uh, or I ask that you would speak a, a personal message to each person here this morning. Would everybody go away changed and transformed because they spent time with you? And so, yeah, just bless this time, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. Um, okay, so so lately, um, okay, so about 20 years ago, um, my one of my aunts came and talked to me, and she said, someday when I go to be with the Lord, I want you to give the message. And um, already she was sort of old, but I mean, this, that was 20 years ago. And so in the back of my mind, I have this, I have this sense that um, I could be called on at any time to give a message at her funeral. And, you know, luckily she's, she's someone who loves the Lord deeply. And so it'll be very easy to, uh, to give that message. But then, you know, I had a birthday recently. So there's that. And I'm starting to get old. And so all of this is sort of, have been, has been percolating in my mind. And I, I'm starting to realize, you know, my life has a, has a, you know, a best before date. You know, eventually I'm going to, um, you know, my, my time on earth is limited, right? And, and so, but that's the same with all of us, right? Now, if you're younger, you probably, you know, aren't really thinking that, but the older you get, you start to, you start to think. But it's as we consider our finiteness, right? The fact that we, we have a, we have an end to our lives, that, um, but those, those moments, those thoughts kind of cause us to think about sort of um, what we do with our lives. What are we doing? How are we living? And uh, then we have verses like we find in James chapter 4 that says this, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. So we actually don't know. I mean, we're, we're alive right now. But we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen the next time we visit the doctor. You know, there could be something we could find. You don't know. You know, with this marathon going on, you don't know if somehow with the way the traffic is has been rerouted, that's going to cause an accident. You know, we don't know what's coming. But realizing that our days are numbered actually gives us the opportunity to take stock and to press pause on our lives and to focus on what we're doing. So, what are you doing with your life? When you think about the things that you're involved in, the different activities, the different focuses that you have in your life, where is your focus? But the bigger question would come from a verse like, uh, or verses like Ephesians chapter 5 that says this, Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity, 
in these evil days? Hmm. Are you making the most of effort every opportunity that's given to you? So, how do we make the most of the time that we have left? You know, it could be one year, it could be ten years, it could be 40, 50 years. But how do we make the most of that time that's left? And most importantly, how do we make sure that what we're doing is actually going to account for eternity? So, um, there were these two guys that were followers of Jesus, and um, they decided that they were going to start to live radically. They were going to follow the way, or do the things that Jesus did. And and um, so, one day they were, they were walking along the street, <clears throat> and they saw this this crippled man on the side of the road, and he was he was begging. And you know, he called out to them. He was asking for some money, and I mean, they didn't have any money. Um, and so they said, well, "Okay, what would Jesus do? You know that bracelet or that that thing uh, that was a few years ago? So what would Jesus do? And well, you know, Jesus would probably pray for that guy, and you know, maybe he'd be healed. And so they pray for him, and he's healed. He's healed right there. And you can imagine." There were people that were watching what was going on. And so there was this ca- a crowd that started to gather. And um, there was actually only one problem with this situation. It was sort of illegal to talk about Jesus in this country. And so um, inevitably, uh, some you know police showed up and took them and put them in prison. And the, uh, the sentence... For being caught, you know, um, uh, you know, arrested for for this kind of thing, you know, speaking in the name of Jesus or praying for people, um, it it could uh, possibly um, come with a sentence of death. And so they're sitting in prison and they don't know what's going to happen. They're they're a little bit, you know, I can imagine being in that situation. You know, we were just doing what Jesus would have done, but yet, you know, we don't know what's going to happen with our lives. And so the next day they were brought up before, you know, the head person, and um, he wants to know, okay, you've been charged with this. Okay, tell me the story. And so they, they explain what happened, and um, okay, so that's interesting. So who is this person? Well, they, they sort of tell who it was, and so he sends um, some of his people to go and find this person. And they find him, and he bring, they bring him in, and um, so, you know, he asks, okay, what happened? You know, these men were were uh, charged with this. And so the, the healed man, he goes and explains exactly what had happened. And so now there's a bit of a, a problem here because, you know, the, these, these two men prayed for this person who got healed. Okay, that's a good thing. Um, but we have our laws. So what are we going to do? So finally the person in charge, he says, okay, if you promise not to, you know, speak in Jesus' name, not to pray for people anymore, We'll let you go. Oh, thanks. Because you want to hear what I'm going to say. No, this is good. And so, um, and so something happens. A, a, this courage wells up inside of them. And they basically say, no, I don't care, or we don't care what you do to us. We are going to continue to speak in the name of Jesus. We're going to keep praying. And a miracle happened. And they were let go. So when Peter and John when this happened to them, so I'm referring to a, a story in the Bible, um, something happened that really shook the early church and and um, caused something to happen that I think today, as we're sitting here, we are the result of what happened in that moment. They began to have a moment of focus where they realized sort of um, what it meant to be a follower of Jesus, what it meant to be a disciple of Christ. And they recognized that they had to make a choice. This, this small community of believers of this early church, they had to make a choice. Were we gonna, are we going to follow Jesus and potentially be thrown into prison, potentially be killed for our faith, or are we going to just put that to the side and just go back to living our normal lives? They knew that the next time that one of their group would be brought before the religious leaders, which was going to happen, that they could lose their lives. 
And as they reflected on their situation, I believe that part of this reflection was regarding how they were going to live the rest of their lives, however long that would be. And when they did, something incredible happened. And let's take a closer look at the story. And so in Acts chapter 4, we read this, and it begins with a prayer, and then there's something that happens. So they're praying, and now, O Lord, hear their threats, so the, the religious leaders, and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Wouldn't it have been amazing to be there in that moment? In fact, wouldn't it be amazing if something like that happened today, when we were praying, and this building would shake with the power of the Holy Spirit? And did you notice in those verses, there's, there's something that sort of stands out. Not once did they pray, did they pray for protection, that somehow God would preserve their lives. In this moment, they were declaring, we are followers of Jesus. We are going to follow you. We are going to do what you've asked us to do, no matter what happens to us. We are going to live the rest of our lives in following Jesus. So here's the thing. When we focus on God's priorities, on the things that ultimately matter, the things that seem to be at the core of our being, things like self-preservation, those things begin to fade away. And we move into a place where our eyes are focused on Jesus and focused on his promises. And when we do this, not only does God show up, but he does in us and through us what we can't do on our own. He uses us. People, ordinary people like us, like the disciples, to do amazing things and to change the world. So what can we learn from this small group of believers? How can we follow their example? Well, when we look at these verses, we can see that, they're, that they lived their lives based on three principles. So the first principle was this. They were focused on Christ. So why were they focused on Christ? Well, many of them had actually been with Jesus. So they had been changed by his truth. They had seen him in action. They'd seen him on the cross, raised from the dead. And some of them even were there when he ascended into heaven. They knew that what they believed was true because of first-hand knowledge. Jesus, God in the flesh, had actually been with them. They breathed the same air as Jesus. So everything that they were about centered on Jesus, what he taught, and the mission he gave to them. So nothing else mattered. When we think about our reality today, what is different? Okay, so that was 2,000 years ago. But in reality, we have everything that those first Christians had. In fact, we have more. We have the same truth that Jesus proclaimed. We have the presence of Jesus with us through the Holy Spirit. So what's changed? So here's a question. How many of us truly believe the truth of the Bible? Like really believe it? Do we trust in the message of the gospel? Because there is a direct connection between what we believe and how we live out our faith. Does that make sense? So, do we believe today like the first disciples believed? Are we centered? Are we focused 
on Jesus? Are we investing our lives in what matters most? Again, they had been with Jesus. They had seen miracles. They had seen Jesus turn water into wine. They had seen Jesus take a few loaves of bread and a few fish and multiply it to feed over what we believe to be over 10,000 people. They saw Jesus um, pray and, and to see demons flee from, from individuals. They had seen miracles. And so they had this incredible faith that God was going to show up in a supernatural way. And that is the second thing, the second way that they lived their lives. They expected the supernatural. But here's the thing. They understood that it was only as they took risks that God was going to demonstrate his power. Hmm. Sometimes, if you're like me, you sort of want God to do all the heavy lifting. To do, you know, we just want to join God in what he's already doing. But really, God is saying to us, step out in faith. Take risks, and I'm going to be there with you. And you watch. We're going to do amazing things together. So do we expect God to do miracles? As we go through life, do we, like the first disciples, expect the supernatural, focused on God, on the God of miracles, and taking risks and trusting Him to act? Again, are we investing our lives in what matters most? So here I just want to talk a moment about evangelism. And we have great sort of training and systems and and ways to do evangelism, right? But here's the thing. Something sort of dawned on me um, the other day. So much of the way that we approach evangelism is based on sort of trying to convince somebody or argue somebody into the kingdom. You know, if our, if our, uh, if our arguments are sound enough, if we can show logically, you know, why it makes sense to follow Jesus, if we can memorize and then quote enough Bible verses, people are going to want to come and follow Jesus, right? I wonder if God had something else in mind. And uh, it sort of involves the supernatural. You see, I believe that God is pursuing us. Everyone on this planet, he's pursuing us. And he wants to use people like us to connect the dots. To bring others into a relationship with him. To reveal his love and to bring healing to people's brokenness. And I believe he's prepared to woo them supernaturally. So an example of this, we're seeing across the world these days, is the way... Um, Jesus is showing up in the dreams of the of Muslims. We are hearing thousands upon thousands of reports of this, where where uh, Muslim people they, they encounter the man in white, and that is the way that God is wooing them supernaturally towards Himself. Um, another example that sort of comes to mind is um, so when we were living in in Quebec City, there was a group that started. Um, a group that um, that decided they were going to go to different places like malls and and they would just look for God to highlight people and then go and pray for them. And uh, my wife, Lori Lee, and, and our son, Tim, they were involved in that for a while. And we've just been talking about how we can maybe get back into doing those kind of things here in Montreal. But anyways, there's a story that I remember of... Um, so... So this group arrived at the mall one day, and then they split up into smaller groups. And these two women, they went, they went around, you know, sort of looking for God to highlight somebody, you know, where they could go and, and pray for them. And they were, they weren't having a lot of success. They, it's like God wasn't um, highlighting anybody for them, and um, and they were sort of getting discouraged and sort of asking, you know, God, why, why isn't there somebody that we could, you know, pray with or whatever? 
And so they were on their way out of the mall, and all of a sudden, they see a woman. And God highlights that woman to them. And she has a limp. And so it's evident that she's in some sort of pain. And, and so they go up to her, and they just, they just start talking with her. And they ask her about her condition. And then they ask if they could just pray for her. So they're not, they're not trying to, to sell the gospel to her. They're just wanting to um, show God's love to her. And so she accepts, and, and they pray for her, and she's healed, just like that. Now, imagine, imagine that moment, and suddenly someone who um, probably doesn't have God on her radar at all is suddenly interested in spiritual conversation. Wouldn't it be cool to be looking for opportunities like that? I think God has placed each of us in a very specific place, including myself, where we're encountering people all the time. We're in contact with different people, whether that's at school or at our jobs, maybe even in our homes or in our neighborhood, our sports teams, our, whatever it could be. God has placed us in specific places. I believe there's a specific reason. And he wants us to join him. Hmm. Wouldn't it be cool to have to be able to have stories like this to share all the time? Anyways, when we walk with the people that God puts around us, do we expect the miraculous? Do we expect with anticipation how God is going to miraculously impact someone's life? Hopefully through us. Is this even on our radar? Or are we too busy to care? Maybe too focused on the wrong things. So what are we settling for in life? Are we investing in things that will last for eternity? And then the third principle that I want to highlight is this. This group of people were also in sync with the Holy Spirit. Let's look again at our text in Acts 4. So after this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they preached the word of God with boldness. For the first Christians, they com completely relied on the Holy Spirit. That's all they had. They didn't have programs to learn about things. They didn't have the Bible like we have. They didn't have amazing worship that could, you know, sort of pump them up. All they had was the Holy Spirit. And they relied on the Holy Spirit for boldness and for direction and for power. In fact, the book of Acts is just filled with stories where, you know, as they relied on the Holy Spirit, that God did amazing things. So there are so many stories where people um, are healed. People are raised from the dead where uh, demons are cast out. Here's the thing. We have the same Holy Spirit that they did. So what, what are you doing with that Holy Spirit? How are you joining? How am I joining the Holy Spirit? Man, that's a good question. So we have the Holy Spirit in us that can literally change the spiritual atmosphere. Do you believe that? So, Bill Johnson tells this story. So, um, there was a grocery store in his neighborhood. And um, they had, I think, good produce and stuff. So he would go there. But this, this place was sort of, um, it gave off sort of a New Age vibe. You know, there were probably some Buddhas, you know, in there somewhere. And and some other, you know, maybe selling crystals or, or whatever. But it obviously was sort of run by a, a new age owner. But they had good produce. So Bill thought, well, you know, the Holy Spirit's in me. I can change the atmosphere because of God in me. And so he would, before he would go in this store, he would, he would sort of align himself with God. He'd say, I, you know, I, I connect with you, Holy Spirit. And I invite you through me to change the atmosphere as I go in this place. And so he would, he would go in this store 
And he would, you know, buy his groceries and then, you know, maybe have conversations with people, but then he would leave. And after he'd done this for a while, uh, one day he was in there and the store owner came over to him and he said, I don't know who you are. I don't know what exactly, you know, you're all about, but every time you walk into my store, there's like this light that shines all around you, this aura. And so Bill was able to share the gospel with him. Wouldn't that be amazing to imagine us walking into our places where we work, or walking into our, our schools, and people would just, they would just sense this aura around us because of God's presence in us. And we would have a chance to change the atmosphere. We'd bring, be able to bring peace into situations that, you know, are not peace. We should be in that marathon space right now, bringing peace, you know, to all the people that are stuck in traffic. But anyway, so are we living a life that is filled with the Holy Spirit, guided by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit? Are we investing our lives in what matters most? So are you focused on Christ? Do you expect the supernatural? Are you in sync with the Holy Spirit? So to close with this morning, I would like to just give you an example of what living this sort of life looks like. So there was this, Sean Boltz tells this story of this young woman who, again, decided that she was going to actually live this way and to be a a true disciple, a true follower of Jesus. And so she said this, you know, she prayed this prayer one morning. She said, Lord, I'm yours today. No matter what, no matter where, no matter when, I'm available to you. Which is a pretty dangerous prayer to pray. And so, Um, She went about her day, and it was later on in the afternoon where she was walking down the street, and she passed by this this corner store. And as she passed by there, this image came into her mind of her standing on her head inside of the store. And she was thinking, okay, that's weird. And so she just kind of kept walking, and as she walked away, the image got stronger and stronger and stronger, and she couldn't get away from it. And then she remembered her prayer that she prayed in that morning. No matter what, no matter where, no matter when. And so she took a deep breath and she went into that corner store and went to stand on her head. And as she got up into the air, she heard a noise coming from the back room as somebody entered the place, saying, okay, I give up. Here's the back story. There was a young man who was struggling with depression and he was planning to commit suicide that day. And he was in the back room, sort of deciding how he was going to commit suicide. And as he did that, a thought popped into his mind, well, I've got nothing to lose, I don't know if there's a God out there, but he just threw up this prayer. He said, God, if you are real, and if you don't want me to commit suicide, when I walk into that other room, there's going to be a woman standing on her head. Are we ready to do that? Are we ready to press in and to live lives that are on the edge, that are dangerous, that take risks in order that the Lord would be glorified? In order that, you know, the Father's orphan children would have a chance to connect with a loving Father who wants to give them an an abundant life. 
But God is looking for people like us to join him in that. So how are we going to live our lives? Is how we live going to matter for eternity? Are we going to focus on the right things? God is looking for an army of people to join him. Would we say yes this morning to his invitation to live radical, amazing, risk-taking lives? Would we be willing to say, yes, Lord, I'm yours, no matter what, no matter where, no matter when? I'm going to take a risk this morning. In a moment, I would like to invite those people who would be willing to say that, to stand. And I want to pray for you. And I'm going to be standing there right with you. Let's make sure our lives count. So if you're if you're willing to say yes to Jesus this morning, I would just invite you to stand. And if you don't want to, that's fine. So for those standing, just I would just invite you to hold out your hands. There's no there's no, uh, you know, I don't know. It's just a cool way of saying, God, I'm available to you. So, Lord, you're seeing, you see all these people standing before you saying, yes, Lord, I am yours. I pray that like you did with that early church, that you would come and you would fill them with your Holy Spirit, you would fill them with boldness and courage. You would give them everything they need to take risks. I pray, God, that as they go into this, this week, as they encounter people, God, would you highlight people that you want them to speak to? Would you open doors before them? Would you give them opportunities to join you in what you want to do? in the lives of your orphan children that need you, desperately need you, Lord. Give us courage. I pray this in your name. Amen.